Hello and welcome everybody to today's webinar, 10 Hidden Google Tools to Keep Marketers Ahead of the Game. Uh, just to ensure you can hear me loud and clear, can you type hi into your chat window or even better, uh, and sticking with eMarketeers tradition, uh, tell us the weather in your area at the moment. I'll give you a couple of seconds to do that and we'll just monitor questions coming in. Just want to make sure, oh, someone says it's overcast. Okay, so you can obviously hear me loud and clear. Sunny, cold, cloudy, warm. <laughs> okay, so you can all hear me. Hear me, that's great. So my name is Jonathan Sape. I'm the founder of eMarketeers and I'm very pleased to have you all here today. Very much appreciate you signing in to today's webinar. Um, just a bit of housekeeping quickly. Um, regarding today's webinar, I'm actually flying solo today. There's no one hosting it. So if you have any questions during the webinar, um, jot, jot them down and by all means email me or tweet them after the webinar and I'll be sure to answer them. Here are my details. <clears throat> feel free to link in with me, follow me on Twitter, Google+, or just email me, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions you've got. Um, also, we're recording this webinar, so we'll be uploading a copy of the slides and a recording onto our blog uh, later on today. So the URL for that is www.emarketeers.com forward slash eInsight. Okay, so let's crack on. 10 hidden Google tools. Um, before I start with the first uh, hidden tool, it's worth mentioning that the word hidden is slightly deceptive because in truth, none of these tools are actually hidden. Um, but we do tend to stick to the, the main Google web search function. And in fact, there are many tools that Google provides, if you find them, that are incredibly useful. So the aim of today is to reveal 10 of them uh, and that you'll discover hopefully during the course of the webinar that they are fantastic for market research, planning, helping you understand audience habits, um, help you with your writing or your uh, content curation. So let's crack on and we'll start with the first tool, which is Googling, go sorry, Google Reading Level. Okay, so you may not know this or you may know this, but if you do a search on Google, um, Google has a filter and it's called a Reading Level Filter. Um, here's an example of a search I did for nuclear fusion, which is not a typical search. Um, if I click on search tools, and then below the search tools um, functionality is um, an option to choose reading level. And as you can see here, Google has split all the search results into basic, intermediate, and advanced reading level. Now, these are based on various reading metrics. So Google doesn't reveal a huge amount about how it calculates these, but we suspect it's based on things like word length, sentence length, syllables, etc., etc. And what we can see here is that for nuclear fusion, um, a great deal of the web's content is either focused on intermediate or advanced reading level. If I wanted to see just the advanced content, I can click on advanced and the filter will uh, enable me to only see advanced content, which is great if I'm a scientist. If I'm not a scientist and I'm not particularly clued up on nuclear fusion, I may want to click on the basic or intermediate content. So this is great to understand uh, where content is pitched and help you with your content planning. If I um, look at another example, athlete's foot. Now, athlete's foot, if you think about that search term, targets two different types of people. We're probably targeting either athlete's foot sufferers or maybe people who are either chemists or biologists or work in academia who want to look at the um, the the more scientific content, shall we say. So as you can see here, there's a lot of different types of content uh, across the web that deals with athlete's foot from the basic to the advanced content. So again, easy way of filtering according to your um, uh, level of experience and knowledge around a particular subject. Now where it's great for marketers is for doing audits on your own content. So for example, I've done an audit on the Hackney Council website. I hope there's no one here listening from Hackney Council. <clears throat> I've typed in the words site colon plus the web address of Hackney Council's website. And what you can see here is that Google has taken all the content and said, right, well, 8% of it, we consider it to be basic. 66% uh, of it is intermediate, 26 is advanced. Now, if you're positioning your content as a marketer, you'd want to ensure that you're hitting the right mark. And I would suggest that councils, particularly maybe London councils, need a fair amount of basic information because not everybody will necessarily have English as a first language and generally speaking the reading level uh, in London boroughs is not fantastic. So this would suggest that maybe they need to focus a little bit more on simplifying their English 
and Google will probably score their basic content higher as a result of that. So there's a little bit of auditing you can do either on a site-wide basis by using the, the, the above example, or even on a page-by-page -page basis. Literally type in the full URL with site colon at the beginning to assess how has Google uh, interpreted your content. Um, having a look at a very good example, uh, here's the BBC uh, CBB section of the web BBC website. Uh, as you can see here, 94% uh, of it is considered to be basic, which you would expect because, of course, the CBB's section of the BBC website is aimed at children or maybe parents. So A plus to the BBC, very good. Um, so do this for your, for your own website or web content after today's webinar, and you'll be able to see your own score. So that's good at Google's uh, reading level tool. The next one is Google's Books Ngram Viewer, which is a fantastic tool for doing research. Um, this is very much hidden. Uh, not a lot of people know about this, but it is, has an absolute plethora of information. Let's go through some examples. So it can be accessed, firstly, at uh, the address below, books.google.com slash ngrams. I wouldn't go to it right now because you'll get distracted. Go to it after today's webinar, and you can have a look. <clears throat> now, what this does is this, uh, this is a tool provided by Google. Google indexes literally millions of books. We're talking about digital versions of books, of course. And it has indexed um, all of these books over 500 years. So we're talking from around 1500 to, to, to the present uh, year. 2014. Now, as you can imagine, there's a lot of content there, and uh, this enables market researchers or planners to really understand how trends have changed over time. And a really good example is this um, report here right in front of you. I've compared science with religion. And what you can see is the uh, very, very interesting uh, growth of science versus religion. Religion has dropped in terms of possible importance when you compare it to science. So from a sociological research perspective, this is of absolute paramount importance and incredible use. Um, let me show you another example. Um, here we have uh, a, a rather humorous but also serious example of cocaine usage in the 20th century or the start of the 20th century. <clears throat> um, as you can see on the right, I've compared cocaine with other various drugs. Um, and fascinating to see that in the late 1800s and the uh, sort of 1990s onwards, uh, or 1980s onwards, I should say, uh, cocaine had really grown hugely in popularity. Uh, so this, this is a phenomenal way of understanding trends in audience behavior, audience interests, and general sociological phenomena. Another example, um, attitudes towards sex and marriage. Um, as you can see here in red, we have marriage, which since 1750-ish has remained fairly constant in terms of content within books. Um, however, um, the word sex has become increasingly popular in the 20th century, particularly in the kind of 1950s, 60s onwards, which uh, is no doubt to do with uh, uh, various uh, attitudes towards, uh, liberal attitudes towards sex and the 1960s sociological surveys around marriage and sex. So a really interesting um, trend here, uh, all accessed for free through Ngram Viewer. Um, attitudes and, and language changes. So this is a great example of language changes over the years. We can see here that childcare has grown in terms of the, the, the actual phrase and the use of that phrase, uh, whereas kindergarten and nursery school have remained fairly constant. So again, an fun, uh, interesting phenomenon that since the 1970s, the, the phrase childcare, no doubt the use of childcare as a, as a phrase in context, uh, has, has grown hugely. And again, incredibly useful from a planning perspective, whether you're planning ad campaigns, content, or uh, just doing audience research. Um, what's great about the Ngram Viewer is that you can also do advanced searches, uh, which we call wildcard searches. So for example, you can add the word drink to a search and then add an asterisk and what Google will do is provide the top 10 results that relate to the word drink. So I did that a couple of days ago when I was preparing this content. And what I found interestingly was that there is um, one particular trend that you can spot, possibly spot in red, which is that we are drinking a lot more alcohol, or at least there, it's mentioned a lot more in books. So that red line has grown and grown and grown. Um, there's a slight increase in wine. Uh, coffee is on the increase. I 
was kind of under the assumption that water would increase, drinking water. Um, it's remained reasonably constant, but it has grown a little bit since the 1990s, which would indicate our interest in uh, bottled water, possibly, versus tap water. So if you're interested in product and the way products have evolved, uh, you can use Google's Ngram uh, search, but use what we call a wildcard search. And just one final example of that is cars. This is very interesting. So I did a search for cars, and again, I added a wildcard asterisk after the word car, which would give me the top 10 results for car. Uh, what's very interesting here is that um, car accident has grown hugely, unsurprisingly. Uh, but what made me really laugh out loud was that car door has actually become very popular. So I guess, we, you know, we, we make assumptions that, of course, car doors are very, uh, you know, part of any car build nowadays. But, of course, um, I guess in the um, early 20th century, um, maybe doors didn't exist on cars. Maybe a lot of them were um, open top and had no doors. So car door has increased in time. Car park has become um, a much um, more popular term used in books. Uh, Interestingly, so is car keys. So, um, fascinating um, tool for understanding trends uh, in socioeconomic, uh, so, sorry, sociological use of words, but also um, general sociological trends. So that's the Ngram viewer. Um, just a point to mention: if you, you you may have done this accidentally already, but if you go to Google and you type in a definition of, or you type in define with a colon. Add a word after it, and you'll get a dictionary uh, definition of that word. As you can see here, I've done a, a dictionary definition of the word fastidious. And what you get is uh, a description of the, um, the word itself, uh, plus its origins slightly beneath that word. Uh, you can also translate that word into various languages using the translate um, drop-down list, which you can hopefully see on the screen. But below that is um, a trend in the use of that particular word. And if you click on that result in Google's web search, you'll actually go to the Ngram viewer. So that's one other way of accessing that tool. So again, have a go um, after this webinar and you'll find some fascinating stuff to play around with. Okay, so um, Google uh, tool number three, the Public Data Explorer. A very, very interesting tool here. So the Public Data Explorer can be accessed very easily at google.com slash public data. And what you'll see is a list of all the different sources that Google uses to publish data. And those sources include the World Bank, the IMF, um, the World Economic Forum, the US Census Bureau, and many more uh, sources in addition to that. Now, what you can do here is use these sources for free to research all sorts of interesting um, country, population, and um, behavioral metrics. Uh, I put together a few examples for you. So for example, this one, I wanted to know which European countries have the safest roads. I might be doing market research in these countries. I might be selling products to these various countries. And I want to know which countries have the most dangerous or the safest roads. And uh, I'm not going to pick on countries here, but looking at the UK, uh, being a road cyclist, I'm fairly comforted to know that um, uh, we're, we're sort of doing pretty well, generally. I'm not sure I'd like to be cycling in Lithuania at the moment because they seem to have fairly dangerous roads. Um, so a fantastic uh, tool to understand um, all sorts of population dynamics and metrics and um, statistics. Uh, I can't show you on this particular uh, webinar, but if you go to the tool later, you can hit that play button, which I've highlighted here, and you can actually watch dynamically the data changing between the years that you've set. Uh, you can also embed this onto a blog, which is a phenomenal way of uh, just um, demonstrating uh, changes in data and behavior. So that's the um, uh, public data tool. There are more reports. Uh, here's an interesting one. Uh, who enjoys the fastest broadband speed? So I measured <coughs> uh, broadband across uh, around six or seven countries. And you know I might be marketing um, content to various countries, or I might be producing video content or games across the globe. And I want to know which countries have good broadband, which countries don't have good broadband, so that I can factor that into my content planning uh, or my video content, maybe. So as we can see here, uh, Japan has uh, the fastest broadband compared with the other countries. Uh, Italy, the slowest out of the countries that I measured. 
Um, UK, not doing too badly, um, but uh, again, you can access all sorts of countries from this, um, this report. You may be targeting third world countries and want to know exactly what the, the broadband usage is across those uh, regions or countries. Um, where are you most likely to find a job? So you can uh, look at unemployment um, across various countries. Uh, so again, if you have a recruitment strategy or, uh, or you, you are a recruiter maybe, uh, and you're targeting various countries, you can see uh, which countries have the uh, biggest shortage of jobs or maybe the uh, largest workforces that are looking for jobs. <clears throat> so you can see here, Spain's not doing too well. Um, UK doing a little bit better um, in dark red. So this is all publicly available information, uh, a quite a phenomenal tool if you want to understand um, audiences, behavior, and various bits of data. So that's tool number three. Tool number four is the Google Display Planner. Now, it's worth mentioning that to access this tool, you have to have an AdWords account. Um, so if you don't have an AdWords account, you can go to google.com forward slash AdWords. Uh, you can register for free. You don't have to pay for anything. Um, you can um, just use the various tools that uh, Google provides, which includes the Display Planner. Let's have a look at it. So the Display Planner allows you to plan ad campaigns across uh, the Google Display Network. So what I mean by that is advertising on third-party websites, which also includes things like YouTube, or Gmail, but third-party websites as well that have opted into Google's AdSense product. So in other words, if you want your ads to appear on The Guardian or on Autocar or on various websites that subscribe to Google AdSense, this tool will show you which sites you can advertise on and whether they're most relevant to you. So as you can imagine, it's a pretty nifty tool for planning ad campaigns or even just doing your research around which sites could be relevant to your target audiences. So I've done a, uh, an example search here. I've imagined I'm selling motorbike parts. So I've done a search for bike parts, <coughs> excuse me, and bike accessories. Um, I can see here at the top, I can see demographic data. Who, who, who am I typically targeting? So from what I can see, I'm targeting mainly people in their 20s or 30s. I'm targeting more, male, more men than women. And from the device usage, uh, data on the right, you can see that it's mainly desktops, but also a, a substantial number of mobiles as well accessing these websites. Uh, below, we can see the various sites that uh, Google has decided are most relevant to bike parts and bike accessories, sites like Autocar and Car Buyer. We can see data such as which ad formats it supports. Unfortunately, I can't show you this on the webinar, but you can, in the tool, you can see which uh, image, image formats it supports. You can see um, things like potential of, uh, volume uh, of cookies set per week. So in terms of Autocar, um, we're looking at a fair number of visitors from 150,000 to 200,000 per week, and one and a half, two million impressions per week uh, if you were to advertise on that particular website. Um, I can also use this tool for remarketing opportunities. So I can decide that I'm only going to place ads on these websites after people have already visited my website, which means that I've already um, created a certain level of expectation. And generally speaking, you'll probably get pretty good performance out of it because people are already familiar with your brand. So this tool is fantastic for media planning, for media buying, uh, for market research, for understanding which sites could be relevant to your um, uh, particular brand or direct response campaigns. Uh, one use of the tool as well is that you can choose placements on websites, mobile apps, or videos or video content. So you could decide, I'd like to try a mobile app campaign only where I'm advertising on various mobile apps, or I might decide to advertise only on YouTube channels. I have an example here. So I've chosen videos. And what we can see in this list here is that there are various YouTube channels that Google uh, allows us to advertise on and feels are most relevant to the search terms bike parts and bike uh, spares. So even if you don't actually run any campaigns, this tool is incredibly useful purely from a planning perspective. So that is the Google Display Planner, once again, accessed only through AdWords. <clears throat> Excuse me, fifth tool is 
Page Speed Insights. Um, some of you may know this tool, uh, some of you may not. This is a free tool available uh, via Google Developer Labs. And this is it here. So a fairly long URL at the bottom, but as I said, copy and paste it at the end of the course, um, and you can, um, at the end of the uh, webinar rather, uh, and you can um, hopefully uh, have some fun with it. Uh, the idea of this tool is that you want to understand the speed and efficiency of your uh, website, both on a desktop and a mobile device. So what you would do is enter your web uh, address. You can enter your homepage URL or a, or a different URL on your website, and Google will display um, your performance. Let's have a look at some examples. So I typed in waitrose.com. I hope there's no one here listening from Waitrose. Um, Waitrose.com's desktop performance um, scored 63 out of 100. So in other words, its uh, page speed was reasonably good, but not fantastic. Google is therefore suggesting um, uh, should fixes, consider fixing, and things that you've done already. So the should fix is in red the consider fixing in orange. Um, so if you're a marketer or you're a non-technical person, this is a fantastic tool to enable you to talk, to, talk intelligently to your developers and say, have you, have you considered the following? Um, so I always tend to show this on our SEO courses because it's probably uh, worth mentioning that speed is a consideration that Google takes into account when uh, calculating its, its, yeah, its ranking algorithm. Uh, and of course, speed is also important purely just from a user experience perspective. Nobody wants a slow website. So this is Waitrose's um, desktop performance. If we click on the tab at the top with, uh, that says mobile, we can see Waitrose's mobile performance, which isn't doing too well, 44 out of 100. Um, and again, Google provides uh, important fixes or things that you might want to consider fixing to put in front of your development team. Uh, it's also worth noting at this juncture that it, you can also access page speed insights from Google Analytics uh, as well as using this tool. So uh, I would probably do both. I would access um, both simply because it's useful to compare the data uh, and maybe measure over a period of days rather than just doing it as a one-off because you never know, there could be glitches in the, uh, in the matrix, so to speak. So um, a very useful tool for marketers, but also uh, for more technical people. Okay, um, the sixth tool. Okay, so I've been a bit naughty here. Um, I've actually got two um, uh, hidden tools, both of which can be accessed through Google's Webmaster Tools. The sixth tool is called the Search Queries Report. So to access Google's Webmaster Tools, you need to set yourself up with a Google Webmaster account, which can be created at www.google.com slash webmasters. Um, this is uh, free to use, uh, but as I said, you do need to have a webmaster login. Let's have a look at um, an example. Before I do that, I really do need to highlight a very important point, which is that Google Analytics, you may know this already, but you may not, Google Analytics does not provide organic keyword data anymore. If you go to your Google Analytics um, uh, profile, you click on acquisition on the left, keywords, and then organic, you'll get a keyword report. But what you'll see normally is the number one um, uh, score in your keyword report is a thing called not provided, which means that Google is basically not providing keyword data from Google to your website. So you can't really work out what people are searching for. Now, as you can imagine, this is uh, this created all sorts of um, debate and angst in the digital marketing community. Um, and Nowadays, we're looking at different metrics to use. But one thing you can do is use Google's Webmaster Tools to access some search query data. And I'll show you on the next slide. So this is a Google Webmaster Tools report. Uh, I log into Google Webmaster Tools. I click on search traffic on the left. And then I click on search queries. Now, the report you get is basically uh, an aggregated set of search queries that people have searched for to find your content. Now, I've had to gray, uh, sorry, to blur the keywords out, uh, as you can see here, simply because uh, for data protection. But uh, what you would see here on your own website is, are the most popular search uh, queries that people have used. Um, what you also get is some very useful data. Um, sorry, there's a very loud motorbike outside. Uh, you get some very useful data. You get a number of impressions that that search query uh, uh, achieved. So in other words, how many times did you appear on Google when people searched for that particular word or phrase? 
you get change metrics. You get how many, um, what percentage of times you've increased or, or decreased over a period of time. So this, uh, you would ex you would hope rather, to be achieving lots of green arrows rather than lots of red arrows. So you want to see that your um, performance is on the rise rather than the uh, decline. You get all sorts of interesting metrics like how many times people have clicked on your search result, your search snippet, having searched for something, which is in the CTR column, and you get average position. So you get some very useful data. Um, if you're looking for a replacement to the not provided issue, this is potentially a good uh, option. Um, it is worth mentioning, though, that you won't see all data here. It tends to be aggregated data, so it tends to be data that is uh, repeated by lots of people over time. And it's also worth mentioning that this data doesn't stay forever. It uh, kind of gets flushed out of the system, so to speak. So if you want to keep that data, you need to click on download this table. Um, and then you can access it through Excel or whatever other means. So this is the, uh, a, a great hidden tool for accessing some keyword data. It's worth also mentioning that you can click on filters at the top, which I've highlighted with the arrow. And then you can access all data that people have searched for on a mobile device or all data that people have accessed or searched for through Google Images or Google Video Searches. And location data, you can see uh, which, what searches people made from various countries. So a really fantastic report and tool um, to fulfill the not provided issue. Okay, um, tool number seven. The, another webmaster tools called crawl errors. Now this is a little bit techy, so apologies to those people who are not familiar with this. Let's have a look at why it's useful. So this is a, a tool a report rather accessed through Google's webmaster tools, um, and it's a report that shows you the crawl errors that Google encountered when crawling your website or web content. Now what you can see here is that there are 863. Um, pages not found, so that would be an error 404 page, or that could be documents not found as well. Now this would initially indicate that there are some pages that you once had on your website that you have subsequently removed, but uh, Google has still found them. There may still be people linking to that content, and if there are people linking to that content, there could well be people visiting those links, or clicking on those links rather, and finding uh, a page missing, which is not the best thing from a user experience perspective. Um, Equally, you may have 863 pages that you removed over a period of time that happen to have lots of people linking to. So you may be um, basically removing all of that link value um, by getting rid of all those pages. So this tool basically does two things. It tells you how to improve your user experience by indicating the pages that you've removed. And it also tells you whether you have missed link building opportunities. Did all those pages have nice, juicy inbound links? And if they did, you are potentially um, removing your search marketing efficiency. So in both cases, you'd probably want to redirect your old pages to uh, a new page or even just a, a, a key page on your website by setting up what we call a permanent redirect or a 301 redirect. So a bit more of a technical tool, this one, but fantastic for improving user experience and fantastic for uh, reclaiming all those juicy inbound links that should be boosting your search rank. If you're not sure about how to use this tool after this webinar, by all means get in touch. I do appreciate it. it's a little bit more technical, this one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Google uh, hidden tool number eight. Now, some of you may be familiar with this, especially those of you who've been on some of the eMarketeers courses. Google Trends, an absolutely brilliant tool. Google Trends can be accessed at google.com forward slash trends. So this tool enables you to see all sorts of data. You can analyze uh, seasonal variations. You can analyze uh, variations in search habits. Let's start with seasonal variations. So here I'm comparing how people search. I've uh, uh, added boys bike and girls bike to my uh, search terms. And I can see very clearly some trends in how those searches are made. Uh, we can see very big peaks and very big troughs, and uh, I can't do it on this webinar, but if you use the tool live, you'll be able to roll your mouse over those peaks and troughs and see the months that uh, had the peaks and the troughs. And in this particular case, as you would probably imagine, Christmas time is pretty popular for both those searches, and uh, January is less popular um, than December for a lot of obvious reasons. But what's particularly useful about this tool is that I can filter. And I'm pointing here to the filters. I can filter by country. I can filter by time, 
I can say I'd like to see uh, searches just from the past 90 days, for example. But what's also very interesting is this. I can filter by web searches or other searches such as Google Shopping searches. Now, uh, filtering by Google Shopping search is particularly useful for retailers because, of course, if people are using Google Shopping and searching through Google Shopping, it shows they have a fairly high level of intent to actually purchase something. If they're Googling uh, stuff through Google's web search, there may be still be a percentage of people who are not necessarily hell-bent on buying, but they're still in the research mode. But Google Shopping searches shows me lots and lots of juicy purchase intent. So using Google Trends enables me not only to see seasonal trends, but also trends across Google's products, and which pretty much highlights uh, a level of intent. So have a play with that. It's, it shows some fascinating uh, results. I, I, I did another interesting one, which is this one. <clears throat> I wanted to monitor share of search for particular brands. So I wanted to compare how was Facebook um, uh, used in Russia as, as compared with some other popular social networks. So we assume, you know, in the West, we assume that Facebook is the most dominant social network across all countries, uh, which is not necessarily the case in absolutely every territory. Um, so uh, in Russia, for example, or some of the Far Eastern countries, Facebook isn't necessarily as dominant. So I compared here, I compared Facebook with two other Russian social networks, uh, the Kontaktia, which I think is how you pronounce it, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce the third one, uh, but you can see the one in yellow. Um, and fascinatingly, what you can see here is that Facebook is not as dominant as uh, the other two, or particularly the Contactia, which has uh, significant dominance in Russia. So if you're planning ad campaigns on uh, social channels, uh, and you're planning those ad campaigns by region, you would uh, find some very interesting data here through Google's Trends tool. Uh, compare uh, market share across countries or compare brands across uh, various countries and you'll see some very interesting data. So that is uh, google.com forward slash trends. <clears throat> Final use of Google Trends. Um, Google Trends has a very, very useful facility where it shows you what we call rising trends or rising queries. So as an example, I did a search for Sochi the uh, venue for the Winter Olympics recently. Now, if I'm a blogger uh, or a journalist writing about Sochi, it would be quite useful to know what other words are trending around Sochi. So here, I've done a search for Sochi, and I've scrolled down the page, and I can see the rising trends. And what's interesting about these rising trends is they don't necessarily include the word Sochi. So we've got phrases like figure skating, or medal count, or hockey. Now, these would indicate that at the time, those were the particular trending phrases or, or queries. And it would also suggest that this is the kind of content that I should be writing about if I'm creating content around Sochi. Uh, this is the zeitgeist, and this is what people are interested in, and the chances are people will find your content if they're searching for those particular words or phrases. Uh, the word breakout, uh, as highlighted below, indicates that those particular phrases were um, inf significantly more popular than they were prior to uh, whichever reporting period you, you put into Google Trends. So this would suggest that at the time these were the most, the highest trending words or phrases and therefore particularly useful to use in your content. So all available for free at google.com slash trends. Okay, um, two more tools to go. This is the ninth tool. This is called Google Correlate. Uh, Google Correlate used to be a, a separate tool when it was in beta. Um, but uh, nowadays, you can access it also through Google Trends. What Google Correlate does, it shows you uh, 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 similar behaviors across different search terms. So let me show you an example. This is a Google Correlate report, and I did a search for the word happy. I wanted to know what other search terms correlate with happy. Now, um, there you go, vodka is the highest correlating term with happy, which is probably not surprising. Uh, but what this tool lets me do is understand your human behavior effectively. It tells me uh, correlations between words and can give me some very good uh, understanding and insight into human behavior uh, and what makes people tick and whether there are behavioral similarities between products, search terms, or services possibly. For example, you may be doing marketing for a brand like The Body Shop. You might discover that people who search for The Body Shop are also interested in areas such as, I don't know, um, uh, 
vegetarianism, for example, or um, uh, you know um, something to do with um, the environment or, or eco stuff. So um, you can use Google's Correlate tool to understand where different uh, search terms have those strong correlations. I did one yesterday, in fact. I searched for the word unemployed. I wanted to know what other words correlate very strongly with unemployed. And what was fascinating was that if you look at the uh, list of uh, highest correlating words, um, a lot of the words relate to um, building type jobs. So we had electrician jobs as, as the highest correlating word with unemployed. We had the brand My Builder featuring twice in that list, which I'm guessing may indicate that people are interested in signing up to My Builder if they happen to be unemployed. Maybe they are out of, out of unemployed electricians or plumbers or builders or whatever. Um, we also have uh, other various search terms. So it's very much uh, you know, worth having a play with Google Correlate to see if you come up with any, any gems. And it might tell you a lot about your audience uh, audiences. So that's access for free nowadays through Google Trends. Okay, um, final tool, Google Images. Now, Google Images, you know, you know don't know, um, but I'm highlighting a particular feature of Google Images, which is called usage rights. Now, people use Google Images all the time. Uh, bloggers use Google Images all the time, and um, I'm sure we've all done it from time to time. We've uh, borrowed, shall we say, uh, an image found on Google Images and inserted it into our blog or presentations and not thought about the copyright issues. Well, there are copyright issues on Google Images. You shouldn't really be borrowing or using images unless you've either got the uh, copyright for them or you purchase them maybe through an image library. So what you can do on Google Images is filter by usage rights. Let's have a look. So I've done a search for iPads. I'm writing a blog on iPad usage. I want a nice juicy picture of an iPad and I do a search on Google Images for iPads. Well. In theory, I shouldn't be using any of these images because they're not mine and I haven't purchased them. I don't have the license for them. But what you can do on Google Images is filter. You can click on search tools, which I've highlighted um, near to the top right, and you get an option uh, which is called usage rights. And you can select the usage right that you that's applicable to you. Um, so you can decide maybe the first one's relevant to you, labeled for reuse with modification, which basically means I'm going to now filter all images that are available for me to use, and I'm also allowed to modify them. Um, and we have two options beneath the bottom. Maybe if you're a blogger but you're not a commercial blogger, you can select images that are labeled for non-commercial uh, reuse. Now, what Google's doing here is it's filtering images that um, are licensed either way. So um, uh, they're either licensed for use or not use. Um, the way you can do that is you can go to creativecommons.org or uh, so you set yourself up with a Creative Commons license, which enables you to indicate whether you're happy for people to use that, images, that, that image or not. Um, if you also want to, you can access uh, the same feature through advanced search. If you go to Google Images, on the right-hand side, you'll see a little gear wheel. You select advanced search, and you'll see an advanced search um, form that you can fill in. And at the bottom of the advanced search form is a thing called usage rights. This is what I tend to use. Uh, I select uh, the usage right, and I would probably choose the bottom one for our blog at eMarketeers, which is free to use, share, or modify, even commercially, which basically means that any of the images you now find, you have uh, the right to do what you want with those images without anyone uh, telling you off. So a pretty useful tool, just in terms of staying within the law and doing things in terms of best practice. So that gives you an idea of, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, some good insight into 10 tools that you can, be, that you can use pretty much now onwards. Um, and uh, as I said to you this, uh, just earlier, if you do want to access this, we've got uh, a slide deck on our blog, yeah, which should be available in about an hour, uh, as well as a recording. So thank you very much for listening today. Um, feel free to connect with us. And um, as I said, any questions, do feel free to email me or send me a tweet after this webinar. Many thanks. See you next time.